Over the last few years, Green parties throughout these islands have sought to broaden and deepen the relationship that we've enjoyed with the trade union movement. And I was very, very pleased to welcome Graham Smith and other representatives from trade unions at our most recent conference. We've found the door open to that approach to broaden that relationship, a sign, I hope, of the understanding that a political relationship between the trade union movement uh, and uh, the political landscape, the party political landscape, needs to be one of pluralism because their allies are so many in the, in the Scottish political landscape and their opponents are so few. So I was very pleased to join with representatives of uh, other political parties, Ian Gray, Christy McKelvey, uh, Willie Rennie and Colin Fox speaking outside at the rally uh, a few minutes ago and I'm delighted that so many uh, of the trade union movement representatives have joined us here in the gallery. But we are going to need to join with them as well. The opportunity to have a debate about this pernicious bill, to vote against it, as it's clear we're going to do in substantial numbers this evening, that's really important. To make that argument in Parliament, to make that argument for a, a legislative consent motion to which I hope again we will say no, and for those at Westminster who are able and willing to challenge this bill to do so as well. But we're going to need to join with our colleagues in the trade union movement as well outside of Parliament uh, over the months and perhaps years to come if this bill does in fact become law. Others have made the case very strongly for a strong trade union membership and I think there is evidence from around the world that countries with a high level of trade union membership, an active trade union movement uh, and the ability for trade unions to represent the interests of their members articulately and powerfully in the political landscape. These things go hand in hand with a more equal society uh, and with a, a better, fairer and healthier workplace uh, for the people those unions represent. There's a case for many forms of democratic workplace, but trade unions are a critical part of that picture and I think that will always be the case. The right ultimately to withdraw your labour to go on strike and to take other forms of industrial action is critical to having people believe that there's a good reason to join a trade union. Trade unions need to be strong enough to be able to act at that last resort if people are going to know that there is a good reason uh, to bother joining. That's something that we all have a collective interest in seeing happen in society. Murdo Fraser tells us that when such action is taken, Everybody in society suffers. And I know, I've been inconvenienced occasionally when there's been a strike in a service that I rely on. People don't like that. Of course not. But I'll tell you what, we would all like it a damn sight worse if we were the kind of society that operated without people's ability to take that last course of action uh, when that final resort comes. We would end up as a meaner, more selfish and more unequal and more exploited society as a result of losing that right. And that's what this legislation is, an attempt to strip that right away from people to act collectively, whether at the first resort or at the last. Whether in terms of the day-to-day -day functions of unions in representing the interests of their members and the extra levels of complexity and bureaucracy that will be piled on top of that, or the barriers that will be uh, placed in front of them when they seek to exercise the last resort and take industrial action. And it is generally a last resort. Willie Rennie tells us that the number of days lost to strike action has gone up a bit in the last few years, and that's true. Uh, it actually went down a bit in the few years before that. Before that, it went up a bit. Before that, it went down a bit. Those year-to-year -year fluctuations have gone on, whether there was a Labour government or since the Tories were put into power in 2010. But the long-term trend shows that other than the 70s and early 80s, the level of strike action and the number of days lost to strike action in the UK has been consistently very low in this country since the 1920s. We should be proud of a legislative framework that allows people to take those actions of last resort, ensures that they have the power and the authority to do so without imposing the kind of absurd thresholds that this bill imposes on them. Taken together, the 40% and 50% thresholds taken together effectively represent an 80% threshold uh, that, that a union would have to demonstrate. Now, this coming from a government uh, which was elected on the votes of fewer than a quarter of the electorate. 
fewer than a quarter of the electorate. And no one can tell us, no one can tell us that the actions of that government doesn't itself impact on everybody, whether they chose to vote for it or not. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, as well as making that case for legislative action, legislative consent being withheld here in Scotland, and challenges to the, the bill's passage at Westminster, if this bill does pass, does pass into law, there is a clear, Would I would say, unanswerable please? case for a programme of non-compliance by the Scottish Government, giving leadership to other employers in the private and public sectors in Scotland, making sure that we have no willingness to, uh, to support this legislation, and that instead we will stand with those unions who feel the need to take industrial action in defiance of it. That's the programme that I hope this Government is willing to commit to, and I will vote for its motion and for the Labour Amendment tonight. Thanks very much.